I'm truly honored and delighted to kick off the first ever global forum on democratizing work. We are facing a catastrophic threat, I think, to democratic capabilities because of this system we've allowed to wire itself into our souls. And um, we need to leverage moments like this one right now to try to get policymakers to step up and do the right thing. At the end of the day, it is in the collective conscience and judgment of our people that democracy as an instrument of their future will survive in this country. You know, we want to democratize work, but democracy is also work. Uh, what we're really talking about is the creation of a new uh, suffrage movement for the 21st century, and that's to be able to get uh, the right to vote in the economy uh, just as much as politics. Le, le même discours commence à prendre aussi, notamment aux États-Unis. The sharing of, of power within companies and giving more uh, power and, and, and to participate to decision making for workers representatives is absolutely uh, central. We need collective uh, movement, we need collective organization, and this is why I think you know uh, this uh, you know the, the democratizing work project is so is so important. If I had to identify one thing which is absolutely essential to improve the quality of care and the recognition and conditions of care workers, it is public employment. It is time the government start giving social protection for domestic workers. We have to see this as a way of saying that involuntary unemployment does not have to be a reality in our country. And for us to say that we're doing this work in a way that tracks alongside the social safety net. From our union, the other thing that a jobs guarantee does is ensure that we are stripping out discrimination from employment. There is a tremendous need for job creation in the ecological transition. The time left to implement the change is now very short. What we see is that 20 transnational corporations, the biggest of all, uh, are responsible from a, a third of these emissions by themselves. Our society has to have a just um, society for all, where everybody can have a work and not be unemployed, where everybody can have a right. And the environment also, we also have a right for it not to be degraded, for it to be kept intact. Tying the security of a job guarantee to um, uh, the action that leads to hope amongst young people in tackling the climate and biodiversity crisis. We know this is excellent policy. No cabe ninguna duda de que esta, eh, de que la sustentabilidad solo es posible por medio de transformación en los sistemas de vida y costumbre de todo el planeta. Change will come from above, below, and from sideways pressures. Yes, that we want something else and that we can uh, have a different future. It is not given to us from above, it's a, a future of our own making. We are the first to be surprised. We are the first to be really enthusiastic about the energy uh, that drives this uh, op-ed turned manifesto turned movement. That sense of um, um, hope that there is another path for economic development that can be that can fit the democratic project and that can, that can meet planetary boundaries. Hello, welcome everyone to the session today. It's a year since we had the Global Forum of which we just played this short reminder and it's great to see so many people back at this first of what will be a series of webinars about topics around the democratizing work uh, manifesto turned book turned movement. Um, my name is Lisa and together with Flavia we've organized the first session here and we are very happy to see you and to learn from each other. Um, we don't have the capacity to organize a global forum every year, 
but hopefully we can create opportunities for people from different countries, from scholarship, from practice, from different walks of life to meet and discuss these ideas here. Today, the topic is about cooperatives um, and Flavia will introduce our speakers in a minute. Let me just briefly say cooperatives are in a way the, should I say the wet dream of all workplace Democrats because they are by definition democratic, you could say, at least if they follow the fully cooperative form, the company is owned by the worker, by the, by the workers. And so there's no separation between capital and labor and decisions they're taking together. That's the dream. The reality is of course often different. And the reality is also very different in different parts of the world. And what we would like to discuss with our wonderful speakers and with all of you today is what cooperatives can really do for democratizing, decommodifying, and also decarbonizing uh, work. Some of you have probably seen that there's a new report by the Club of Rome, Earth for All it's called. And it doesn't say a lot about democratizing work, but it does mention that giving more voice to workers is an important element. And it says a lot about inequality and gender inequality. And those are also things where cooperatives, at least in theory, on paper, could be part of the solution. Um, and so the question is, what, yeah, is, are these hopes justified? Should we put so much hope in cooperatives? And if so, how could they be facilitated? What obstacles are there and how could they be removed? And how could the cooperatives in different parts of the world also cooperate amongst each other? So those are questions that I want to put on the table for today's session. And now I hand over to Flavia to introduce our speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone. Bon pomeriggio, boa tarde. Uh, to bring a global perspective on cooperatives, which involves informally precarious workers who have always existed in the global south, and new informal precarious workers related to digital platforms, which now appear in the global north, this webinar brings together three speakers from three continents with expertise on the cooperative sector. As Lisa said, together with them and in dialogue with you, we want to explore how co cooperatives can contribute to democratize, democratize firms, decommodify work and decarbonize the planet, situating how cooperatives act in different countries, which means also using a uh, decolonial perspective in this sense. So let's introduce our speakers. Training originally in sociology and we, with a PhD in polit political sciences, Sonia Maria Dias is a garbologist specializing in solid waste management. Prior to joining the Women in Informal Employment Globalizing and Organizing Network, she has had that experience as a city officer working in the municipal cleaning agency of her hometown in Brazil. As a consultant for international agencies, as an Eisenhower Fellow for the Common Interest Program on Challenges of Urbanization, amongst other voluntary and academic roles. Sonia's interests include promoting social inclusion, gender equity, and occupational health in waste form worldwide. Surotto graduated with a bachelor's degrees in economic faculty from General Sudirman University in Pocuerto, Central Java, Indonesia. Since his student days, he's involved in various activities for developing socioeconomic, democracy, and cooperative thinking and practices. He has led cooperative study institutions and has been the founder and, founder and an active person in several cooperatives, both nationally and internationally. Currently, he is the chairman of the National Association of Socioeconomic Strategic Cadres and CEO of the National Federation of People's Enterprises Cooperative. He has written freelance articles in various media outlets, especially in the fields of, the, of 
cooperatives and democracy and advocates for economic regulations and policies. And finally, Morshed Manahan. Morshed is a legal researcher focused on blockchain governance and platform cooperatives. He's a currently Max Weber Fellow at the European University Institute in Italy. He received his PhD from London Law School on the emergency of democratic firms in the platform economy. He's a member of the Blockchain Gov research project and a research affiliated of the Institute for the Cooperative Digital Economy at the New School in New York City. Prior to the Max Weber Fellow Program, Moore Shed was a research associated at the Robert Schumann Center. During his PhD, Moore Shed acted as an expert for the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs on the legal framework for platforms cooperatives and consulted for the International Cooperative Alliance and for the National Cooperative Business Association uh, CL USA International on topics of cooperative law. Morshed has also been called to the Bar of England and Wales and it is enrolled in the Bar of Bangladesh. Welcome everyone. Benvenuti, benvindus. Uh, I'll give uh, the floor to Sonia now. Sonia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here and share a bit of our work. Uh, it's a pleasure to be amongst all of you, and I look forward to the debate and learning a lot from um, all of you. The next slide, please. Uh, well, with the advancement of um, neoliberalism uh, and how uh, neoliberalism has been informing discourses and practices, based on the assumption that government authorities should not or are not capable of assuming in terms of the main responsibility for protecting people's livelihoods. Individuals and communities are increasingly being pressured to rely on their own resources to confront uh, hardships. Um, in, for instance, in many cities of the global uh, south, in, in the absence of solid waste collection or in the absence of municipal recycling systems, waste pickers cooperatives have been formed and have been fighting for integration into uh, formal waste management schemes. And for, in our understanding, uh, these cooperatives have been complementing and uh, the formal solid waste systems with a cooperative one, which is based, particularly in, in the context of where I come from, Brazil, uh, based on recovery of recyclable uh, materials. And there is a whole body of literature that has been discussing how uh, cooperatives and some co-production models can be often associated with uh, the uh, neoliberal agenda. But we go, uh, my work and uh, the work of other we go uh, uh, members, we have been documenting uh, examples of a bit more transformative uh, experiences in the waste sector. In my country, in Colombia, in Argentina, and also in India, there are strong waste picker cooperatives that are providing jobs and in many cases a more decent source of income for their members. Uh, and in our, particularly in our work with cooperatives in Brazil and also in Colombia, where we work very closely with cooperatives, uh, we have seen the waste speakers playing a key role in, in the urban uh, economy and urban system. And the cooperatives have been uh, shaping some alternative routes for creation of green jobs and for formalization uh, through uh, their struggles for social protection, for decent work and 
for being acknowledged as service providers. And so cooperatives, our work has shown that cooperatives can carry out many functions, many social functions uh, by avoiding social economic exclusion, also providing a public health service because in some cities of the global south, they are the only ones who are providing some sort of service and services. And they can be economic actors, very key economic actors in the recycling chain. Uh, they prepare also, they also prepare workers to engage in the, the public sphere. So they play a role in enhancing channels of social dialogue and political contributions. And they can be more conducive to the work of women. However, this is not a given. And my, my talk here is all about the need for us to critically engage with the gender inequalities within cooperatives movements as as a kind of contradiction to the constitutive ideals of the cooperative movement. And if we don't acknowledge that and confront and build programs and policies to address gender inequalities, we are not really contributing for cooperatives to play the role that they should in uh, at least in their principles around democratization of work. The next slide, please. So very quickly, this is what we have been doing in uh, particularly here in Brazil, but in other contexts, we have been trying to engender gender and waste. And we started this process uh, 10 to 11 years ago with the idea of uh, through uh, critically engaging with the gender inequalities within the cooperative, cooperative movement to strengthen collective action and to revitalize the movement. So uh, the, 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 the guiding questions for us were around what are the consequences of reproducing multiple dimensions of gender inequality in, within the cooperative movement? Uh, isn't this against the uh, very principle, constitutive uh, principles of the cooperative movement? How can we bring gender awareness and renew these ideals? How can we introduce gender in a movement where sexism is so deeply entrenched? Uh, the next slide, please. So we started this project, a collaborative project involving the national movement of way speakers, involving the university. I was a teacher there at the federal university and also WIGO, which I, I, I'm also uh, there, you know, working as a global specialist. And through uh, collaborative coordination, we involved these partners and we built uh, in the first phase a, a research action project mapping the obstacles, practical and strategic obstacles and needs that women have to be fully empowered. And then we went on producing key resources like uh, popular education, gender toolkits, academic slash practitioner, uh, gender toolkits, and through a process of popular communication, we uh, started to involve uh, women and men uh, from the way speakers uh, movement. And we had uh, so far run many individual coaching sessions and also many capacity building. So this is all with the goal to foster individual and collective empowerment in understanding empowerment with a broader view in terms of economic, political, and symbolic. The next slide, please. So uh, we, I think uh, I, we can uh, go to our um, video, please. Do you want to, sorry about that. Here you're going to hear the women's voices, because I think this is very important rather than hearing my voice only. Olá, tudo bem? Eu sou a Marinette, eu sou uma catadora do Brasil. Eu vou contar para vocês um pouco sobre as Bonitas, um grupo de mulheres mineiras que ao longo dos anos resolveu se juntar, se capacitar 
produzir um plano de ação para avançar com as questões de gênero. Nós mulheres, nós não tínhamos voz ativa, nenhuma mesa, nenhuma fala. Às vezes, quando nós participávamos de alguma atividade, reunião, algum debate, nós só era ouvindo. O projeto ele foi conceptualizado, estudado de forma muito participativa e tendo como um, um norte ah, essa questão de atuar ao mesmo tempo no coletivo e no plano individual. E todo esse processo gerou a produção da cartilha Mulheres Catadoras, um marco muito importante nesse trajeto, que foi lançado em abril de 2005 com lideranças femininas e masculinas do Brasil e da América Latina. E nosso plano de ação saiu ao final desse processo. E em dezembro, a gente já estava com o plano de ação é, todo elaborado. A gente está conseguindo passar é, para todo mundo o que, que é essa questão de gênero, o que, que a gente precisa avançar, como é que a gente constrói isso junto, cresce junto. Então, a gente está é, bombando viu, com o nosso plano de ação e fazendo ele até sem sentido. Ninguém matando a bom que não gosta. Sempre com muito cuidado. E solidariedade. Contamos com você, viu? Conto com você. Contamos com você. Well, I wanted to bring, this is just a snippet of a 18 minutes video in which the women have their own voices. And I wanted to bring this uh, for you guys because I think it's, uh, there, there were some very powerful lessons for us. And the idea for us to really bring the visibility to women's contribution to the cooperative movement has really been revolutionary for the National Way Speakers Movement. And because we really started by listening to women first and then slowly brought up women, uh, uh, men, into the process, this created a safe space for these women. And for us, it's very important that we are able to begin with women and then slowly building in men within the process of addressing gender. The next slide, please. Yeah, the next slide. So uh, I think it uh, the, the main lesson here is how it is important to build gender awareness, not disconnected from the cooperative gender ideals. We, we have all these, you know, wonderful ideas that, uh, you know, brings cooperative closer to democracy, but we cannot take uh, that uh, for a given, you know, democracy itself and also gender awareness. So it is important that uh, our praxis, it's really uh, can articulate gender injustice within the cooperative movement. The next slide, please. I quickly bring you just a few highlights of a, a corporate, uh, comparative uh, study that we did with the ILO, which really highlights how important cooperatives have been for way speakers, but it also brings about how relevant it is uh, to really factor in gender so that the empowerment of women is not taken as a given within the cooperative movement. The next slide, please. So just very quickly uh, to conclude so that we can have more time for discussion later. Uh, the point that I wanted to make here is that uh, we cannot take democratization of work as a given within the cooperative movement. We cannot take gender equality as a given within the cooperative movement. And it is only by factoring gender and building awareness and uh, building capacity of women in terms of the uh, practical and strategic needs that uh, we are really going to contribute to uh, have the cooperative as uh, 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 an important space for democratization of work. So thank you very much. I hope I didn't go over my time. 
Thank you, Sonia, for this inspiring presentation. I'm really happy to see it because I didn't know you and we are from the same city in Brazil. So uh, I'm especially moved by your presentation. So thank you so much. And now I'll, I'll pass the word to uh, Suroto. Mm. Thank you, Flavia. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Suroto from Indonesia. Um, yeah, um, uh, I think it's so very, uh, 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 interesting that uh, we talking about the cooperative democracy and uh, democratization ISIS. Uh, basically, in the early um, cooperative, let's call in the history of Pioneer Rocksdale in England, when it was founded 177 years ago, is the same as the declaration of the importance of equality in the workplace by workers how equality and justice are to be found in the working place and daily living. It's not just about opening a saw or just talking about economic, economical things, about how a business should be done. The cooperative movement wants everyone, including workers, to be treated equally in a making decisions in the companies where they work and earn a living. It is not only in the hand of the dominant investor as uh, the working system of the capitalist corporations. In my opinion, um, cooperative is a sophisticated um, modular which allow democracy to work in the real life. This is because political democracy without economic democracy only creates oligarchy and plutocracy and or autocracy in everyday life, which is an anti-democratic regime. I see that cooperatives are not only important instrument in, in realizing democracy in the workplace, but also important for realizing the post, a post-capitalist society system. I see the trend of the development of traditional society globally in the form of Association that develop in the modern society today will lead to demand to the need for democratic, transparent, and responsible, responsible community governance for the great interest of living with the global community. In my opinion, this community demand is in line with what, what was the initial mission of the cooperative. Cooperatives are the voice of humanity which that flow to uh, all of the world, uh, a corner of the world, how everyone is given equal recognition in making decision in the uh, in in making decision to live together. How people are rewarded reciprocally for all of their hard work. There is no super, superior rights over one's self over other just because of the power over the material capital they have. No one is allowed to oppress others and damage the environment for any reasons. Cooperatives are accepted worldwide for those humanitarian reasons. Cooperative based on the substantive, substantive understanding on the attraction of private interest and public interest. In my opinion, are also quite ideal paths because cooperative as well as cooperative democracy allow for the balanced form of public accountability from private interests. Cooperative protect private right and private ones become responsible to for the public interest. This is different from, for example, capitalist private corporation which actually support the power of private authorities to become authoritarian in everyday life. Today, there are approximately 1.2 billion people worldwide who are members of cooperatives in the 3 million cooperatives spread over 100 million countries. They have succeeded in gathering financial resources as well as organization disciplines. They have succeeded in establishing cooperative in the various sector, be it uh, daily 
necessities of life to service and public good from the retail business to the public services as hospital and electricity this is an important modality that must be continuously grown and fought for to create better a better world society i do not intend to lot size the cooperative solely to invite or provoke us to fight for what has been done by cooperative practitioners who work to add a statistic to cooperative every day in the field but here i want to show how how the problem the problem of inequality in the cooperative development occur in a various part of the world and what causes it when i get an opportunity to see and learn more about the development on, and structure of cooperative abroad for example in canada i seen that the, the development of cooperative in this country is quite good and growing in the various sector how do i see their business services such as credit union which is owned by million of people so massive and even once the best bank in canada like credit union this term then one of their agriculture a cooperative like la fedre where which is based in a quebec city is growing and leading the market and many more not only in canada but also i see positive development in the north country for example how their consumer cooperative have developed with and become a people choice in sweden then even though i have never seen in myself but i get a lot of info on organizations such as the mondragon worker cooperative is able to create democratic democracy and in the workplace by giving equal footing right in the decision making process of 80000 employee in one organization and company the development of cooperative above looks like very in contrasting if we compare them with the cooperative in my country for example in indonesia we are the owner of the largest number of cooperative in the world we have recorded the largest number of cooperative in the world uh, 2000 to 200 212000 cooperative with the members um 37 million people before the registrations cooperative in indonesia are growing more dominated a uh, fake cooperative or quasi cooperative they are cooperative legal entity but in practice is not it is it's only a private capitalist business which is controlled and operated by and for the benefit of the owner of capital they even contribute a lot of damage in the image of cooperative because not only deviate from its values and principle but many use it's to deceive the public for short term personal gain besides being made for worse by the birth of nameplate cooperative that uh, are born like mushroom in the rainy season due to the stimulus of the government national program rather than being developed as a form of business or services to respond to the natural needs of member and or community there are several basic problem that make cooperative in indonesia less favorable to develop i see cooperative in indonesia as different from cooperative in the north country the this problem are related to the paradigm regulation and policy as well as carrying capacity for social economic and political environment and uh, the paradigmatically in the paradigm paradigm cooperative in indonesia are understood by the public as merely a business entity even when asked to lay people they identify the cooperative as a mere saving and loan business even this they do not understand if the cooperative is company or organization that belongs to them there are not many young people in indonesia today who are involved in the cooperative cooperative are not only has aging problem but are starting to despair from the minds of young people they are not many campus and make cooperative a subject at school or course in campus a simply seen as a study material cooperative are not seen as an important sign cooperative get unfair treatment before to comes to mind it comes to mind 
this serious problem eventually has a very spread effect and affect to the way people view cooperative. The fundamental problem in terms of the paradigm in the future access state by the existence of regulatory barriers and government policy. In our plenary study, cooperative in Indonesia are widely discriminated against, subordinated to, and even eliminated from to realism of national regulation. Call it, for example, for form, the form of serious obstacles, such as how cooperatives are not allowed to enter the public service sector, form to foreign investment, and many more. Cooperatives are deliberately excluded from modern business line are, and are not recognized in various social, economic, and community law. Even in policy term, in the government alignment with the capitalist corporation looks very vulgar to give their support to kill the cooperative. For example, in the financial sector, which is the dominant sector of cooperative in Indonesia, the government provided many special rights, such as in the form of interest subsidies, placement funds, equity participation, uh, guarantee institution and even they provide bailout fund when they are bankrupt. bankrupt. All of that is not obtain, ob obtained by cooperative and cooperative are told to, com to compete in the unhealthy business environment like this. Cooperative in Indonesia in the developing countries in, in general do not have adequate support capacity to develop. All of this cannot be separated from serious geopolitical problem and the country's social economic background. In Europe, for example, cooperatives develop because their autonomy in a relative value. Unlike in the developing country, which depend on the role of the political elite and government program. Meanwhile, we understand the global imperialism that infiltrates through the multinational corporation always use the structure of feudal elite and corrupted uh, bureaucracy from the developing countries. They also certainly do not want a good development and independent in the cooperative because this means that it will become a serious threat to the interest of global capitalism. Capitalism and global imperialism with the agenda of the Washington consensus and its model capitalist liberal democracy have been able to reach a state, a serious control over the pillar of the political and economic power of the certain country, as well as their resistance force at the democratic level and in the demo domestic level. They have become Levatan in the gigantic power of economic, digital economic, and also their engineering tactical organization in the global level to in to influence political and economic policy, both fiscal and monetary in certain country through traps, um, of debt traps, a foreign investment trap and consumption trap. For this reason, Heriwet proposed several important recommendations for this democratizing work movement as follows. Encouraging wider public understanding of the importance of cooperative by forming systemic and massive epistemic growth to conduct and produce, reproduce discourse on economic democracy and cooperative. There, there need to be a great solidarity from the entire world community, especially from scholar, young person and civil society movement and cooperative to push the agenda of the economic democratizations, encouraging this emergent of the counter narratives and serious advocacy such as implementing employee share ownership program is of in the capitalist company digitizing a fire economic with the multi stakeholder cooperative ownership model democratization toward direct community ownership through the cooperative system from the state owned companies platform cooperative movement and others etc Encouraging advocacy on the direction of the government regulation and policy at the macro level so that they move toward an economic democratic system and break away from the classical economic policy model. This is my input for this case. Thank you, Flavia. I'm sorry for a long time. 
No, it's all right. Thank you, Suroto, for this global perspective of cooperatives, like since the ground practice until epistemological problems. Thank you for this outstanding uh, input. And now I will give you the word to Morshad Manan. Morshad. Thank you. Um, would you please be able to put my slides up? So today, uh, could you go to the next slide, please? The next slide, please. Yes, so today um, I'll be talking about um, firstly plat platform cooperatives, introducing particularly platform cooperatives in the global south, and then speaking about the dilemmas that, of participation that uh, worker cooperatives in particular face, and the elements uh, for successful worker participation that we've uh, learned from uh, decades of research on this subject before looking at some emerging research on participation within platform cooperatives. So the reason why I think this is interesting is because the most interesting thing about cooperatives is that they are attempting to achieve what most social science tells us is impossible, a viable participatory democracy within firms. So platform cooperatives, according to the um, one definition that's become influential, is an enterprise that operates primarily through digital platforms for interaction or the exchange of goods and or services and is structured in line with the ICA statement on the cooperative identity. So what is important here are a few words that I've highlighted. So the primarily part is one of the ways that it distinguishes itself from other types of cooperatives that might also have platforms. It's that um, its business would not exist if it was not you know, interacting using uh, a digital platform. And then the other aspect that is important is that um, there isn't in the platform cooperatives a movement of fastidiousness or a rigidness when it comes to um, legal entity form. So, of course, there is an encouragement of using the established available uh, cooperative society or cooperative legal structure in a particular jurisdiction, but it also recognizes that, uh, as was mentioned by previous speakers, the cooperative law in a given jurisdiction might not be most suitable. And so, as a consequence, it is necessary to uh, accommodate um, pre like prefigurative structures or other types of structures as long as they are structured uh, along with uh, in line with the cooperative principles and values. Next slide, please. So at, at the moment, according to um, Trevor Schultz, there are over 500 such uh, platform cooperative projects um, spread across many different economic sectors from across the gig economy. So remote labor, local, uh, local uh, work, of course, to asset sharing in the sense of uh, short-term home rentals to uh, platform cooperatives that are in the agro industry to even uh, data cooperatives. And there are also um, a, a considerable variation in terms of the types of uh, platform cooperatives. So you have platform labor cooperatives, and that's what I will be speaking about most, but you also have uh, consumer cooperatives and that are um, platform cooperatives as well, uh, as uh, or and of course multi-stakeholder cooperatives, which are also very relevant for this uh, discussion. One of the reasons I put uh, this picture up from Up and Go, a, a domestic workers cooperative in uh, New York, is because it highlights very succinctly what the advantages of using a platform cooperative are in comparison to using uh, a, a, a corporate platform. So there are there's an opportunity to earn fair wages, to make one's own schedules, and to spend more time with one's family. Next slide, please. So in research that I've recently just completed and is uh, under review uh, right now, one of the uh, issues that my co-authors and I were looking at is the research on the connection between cooperatives and poverty. So one of the scholars who's done a lot of research on this is Johnston Birchall. Unfortunately, the late Professor Johnston Birchall passed away uh, last year, but he left us a body of work that uh, really provides a lot of inspiration for current and future uh, cooperative scholars, including, but not limited to, on the question of poverty and its connection to um, how cooperatives can help alleviate it. 
So we had four broad takeaways from this uh, body of research that uh, he left. One is that cooperatives can indeed contribute to poverty reduction, uh, that they are able to encourage participatory development and be because of the fact that you have this member involvement in democratic processes and thus uh, people are able, members are able to self-help, uh, use self-help methods to uh, raise themselves from poverty. There are certain comparative advantages that he identified of using a cooperative as opposed to an NGO or a corporate structure. And there are certain enabling conditions that help in, uh, ensure that these beneficial uh, contributions materialize. So to point out three, one is that this particular relationship that cooperatives have with the state, as has been mentioned uh, previously, uh, the Birchall and his colleagues assert that uh, cooperatives have to retain their autonomy from the state um, and so uh, they shouldn't you know, be created artificially by the state or uh, be imposed on a particular community. The second enabling condition is uh, relatedly having a strong internal democratic governance process. Uh, that is another important enabling condition. And then finally, you also have uh, the capacity for cooperatives to not only network with each other, but with uh, other value aligned actors. And so what we're seeing is to give some concrete examples um, that the co platform cooperativism um, might have received a lot of attention in the global north, but is starting to expand to the global south as well. So we have, for instance, uh, the federation of 80 plus platform cooperatives um, like Co-op Cycle, which is now operating in Argentina. And there, um, you know, as very distinctly from corporate platforms, the workers uh, who use one of the, or part of one of the 80 platform cooperatives can co-determine the design of the platform. They do not um, have to um, be worried that co-op cycle is collecting or processing their data. That does not, that, that does not happen. And uh, thirdly, co-op cycle ha has developed its own license, a uh, type of copy left license or a copy left license, which among other things requires that any organization that wishes to use their software must be organized as a worker cooperative and function as a social enterprise. And so we see here uh, quite a significant difference from what uh, a corporate platform um, does. Next slide, please. And so um, we also see um, another very interesting example moving from Argentina to Kerala in India with Yatri, which was set up uh, uh, as a cooperative by uh, with, and with the support of a municipal authority in Kerala. And there, the idea of this particular cooperative created during the, financial, uh, during the pandemic was that uh, it would have, you know, drivers join these cooperatives and become its employees and thereby guarantee a minimum wage, access to a provident fund, having days off, as well as a patronage return, meaning that they get surplus based on how many transactions they have with that uh, cooperative. And as the application was developed by a municipal authority, there is no transaction fee that is charged. And this provides considerable job and income security to the thousands of drivers uh, that have joined the platform cooperative till now. And so what we did is that we refine, based on looking at some of these examples and more, um, refine some of Birchall's findings. So we, if we talk about poverty reduction, for instance, which he identifies, well, one of the th ways that they're able to uh, contribute to poverty reduction is by not only addressing income, but also other needs of members. For instance, um, digital literacy skills, helping, um, you know, platform workers refinance um, assets like a car. Then when it comes to participatory de development, it's uh, what is different from the types of cooperatives that Birchall would have studied uh, is that there is now a novel uses of data that um, uh, was not as pronounced in the past. Um, and this allows uh, a different sorts of decision-making. And this is not only data of their own, but also the data of the cooperative itself. And then th there continue to be comparative advantages that cooperatives enjoy, but it depends on the type of uh, sector we're talking about and the, the type of metric we're talking about. So if we're talking about, for instance, worker pay, then platform cooperatives in principle um, should be able to have uh, uh, better pay, or at least that is what they aspire to, even if it is not always um, 
materializing in that way. But when it comes to market share or revenue, of course, pl platform cooperatives still lag behind their corporate competitors. And then finally, and I think really interestingly, um, the enabling conditions are also a bit different. And so rather than this sort of purely, um, let's say arm's length relationship between a cooperative and the state, what we are seeing is the emergence of what we call like platform cooperative ecosystems, where the platform cooperative is uh, entering into relationships and partnerships with other um, value aligned actors, including progressive municipal governments. And we see this as being a positive thing if uh, it does not lead to you know, overbearing control by the state. And I think this is something that we call for future research on. And there's also increasingly the use of digital tools for governance, which is also a distinct aspect of this. Next slide, please. So as I'm approaching the end of my time and I want to allow for questions, I want to highlight some particular points that are already clear from my presentation. And that is that participation is a very important aspect of not just traditional cooperatives, but also contemporary uh, platform cooperatives. So there's this recent paper um, on, you know, paradoxes of participation in cooperative governance. And one of the seven that is identified is about uh, maintaining member participation. So this is a difficult, there's a difficulty, um, as you can imagine, in ensuring that members remain active, involved and committed in governance processes over time and as a cooperative grows given the importance of democracy to the cooperative identity, while also being a an economically efficient organization that needs swift decision-making. So the deliberative part and the efficiency part can be a trade-off with each other. And one of the reasons we see this is because there are demands on people's time. Um, there's an emotional intensity of uh, meetings. There's a lack of experience with democracy at the workplace. There is environmental constraints on workplace participation and individual differences in strengths and weaknesses to contribute. Next slide, please. And so um, if you look at the work of Bernstein in particular, he gives us a lot of very helpful insight in what are elements that are needed for worker participation to be successful. So for instance, he talks about, and I'll keep this very brief, um, I, we can, I can address this more in, uh, questions, the, that worker access to management level information is needed. There needs to be a protection from reprisals uh, for worker members if they are critical. There needs to be a dispute resolution process for uh, these sorts of internal disputes. Uh, the values and attributes that member, uh, members and leaders have have to align. If you go to the next slide, please. And here are some of uh, the values that and qualities that he identifies with respect to, for instance, cooperative leaders. So for instance, holding egalitarian values, um, governing by merit, um, explanation and consent, um, you know, having confidence in others and being willing to listen and delegate, uh, as well as uh, education. Next slide. And so then uh, finally, he also talks about among the, the sort of successful worker participation requirements that there needs to also be patronage returns based on transactions with the firm. And so this is to be seen as a right rather than something that is given discretionarily as it is with uh, top executives in a corporation. And that um, this is another way of aligning these sorts of incentives between the broad base of a cooperative and uh, um, the interests of the cooperative as a whole. Finally, if we go to the last slide. If we look at um, what is happening, now that we have this body of worker participation related research, as well as this new development with respect to platform cooperatives, there is now an effort to uh, sort of bring this uh, bodies of research together by examining several cases of platform cooperatives empirically and seeing whether there are certain distinguishing features between platform cooperatives and worker cooperatives, but also whether those distinguishing features impact on participation, such a key feature of uh, these types of uh, firms. So what, uh, four distinguishing features we identified were multi-homing, that there was a reduced role for member investments in the cooperative. So it, unlike a worker cooperative where maybe tens of thousands of euros might have to be invested here, there was a reduced role for it. 
there was an emphasis on scale by many platform cooperatives, but, but not all. And there was also an untetheredness of the worker members from a fixed physical workplace. Now, of course, I'm talking about um, a, a limited you know, group of platform cooperatives, as I mentioned, the platform labor cooperatives. But we did see some very interesting implications of these distinguishing features on participation. So the fact that there was multi-homing by workers across platforms, including corporate platforms, largely had a negative effect on um, participation of actually attending meetings. There was also a largely negative effect of the fact that there was a reduced role for member investments. And finally, um, there was also a uh, like a largely negative effect of the fact that platform cooperatives were scaling on uh, participation too, but the fact that the worker members were untethered actually had a mixed effect. So on the one hand, it created less of a reason for members to actively participate in governance, but at the same time, it created opportunities for, for instance, the, the worker member to uh, be on a Zoom call while uh, doing their work. And it created a sort of flexibility to participate in governance processes, which they might have been unwilling to do so in the past. And with that, I think that's my last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Moshet, and thank you all three for these really rich and nuanced inputs. I'm burning with questions, but we want to involve lots of people. Can you please raise your hand if you want to ask a question to one of the speakers, and if you're in a position to unmute yourself and actually ask it um, orally, uh, if you can only type, then type into the chat and we'll try to read out the questions. Um, and while I'm waiting for a show of hands, I'm also, uh, I want to give the floor once more to all the three speakers to ask whether you want to briefly react to each other or whether there are particular points that you want to pick up from each other. Martin, you're nodding. Do you want? Did you have a question for either Sonia or Suroto? I, I I had a question for Suroto actually. Um, I was really curious to he learn more about um, the particular challenges uh, that using a cooperative in Indonesia faces. He mentioned, if I heard correctly, that there are restrictions on foreign investment in cooperatives in Indonesia. And if if I understood what he was saying, but. I, I, that, 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 among others, um, would be something I'd be really interested in about whether there are restrictions on foreign members joining cooperatives, whether there are restrictions of Indonesian nationals joining cooperatives abroad, and so on. Thank, thank you, Mazat. Um, yeah, um, uh, according to the law of uh, the, <clears throat> the investment, uh, investment law, um, that is a restrictor to cooperative uh, to use the cooperative as a legal entity to uh, to become the investment uh, foreign direct investment and uh, i think this is a very uh, difficult for uh, 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 yeah when the foreign direct investment come they 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 should be used the capitalist corporations a model and then that make the cooperative will be uh, very weak because multinational corporation come and uh, they give a direct investment in uh, also in the digital economy. As you know, <laughs> we have uh, today, uh, we have uh, 90, 93% in the marketplace is uh, the product is come from outside or imported. And also uh, the investment investment of the platform, the investor of the platform, all of them is dominated by um, yeah, foreign direct investment. And that's why uh, I think that this, this is here in Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you. Now I see a hand from Esther Barniaga, if I'm saying that correctly. Esther, over to you. Thank you. Hi, I'm a professor at, the, at Lund University and I'm very interested in this topic. Um, I, thank you very much for the presentations. I've been uh, taking notes, very interesting, all of them. And I have a question to relate the first and the last presentation and then a clarification question to the last one. Um, so maybe I start with the relation one. Is that okay? 
And uh, Sonia was very clear and I think very uh, good to start the discussion with actually on the, on the need to, to work with the gender dimension. Um, not that these cooperatives as you were doing in the chat are more gender unequal, but that actually it strengthens the whole movement as I've understood if we work you know, if we highlight the gender dimension of cooperatives. And so I was wondering, Morshed, if you've been looking at platform co-ops from that perspective. So th this is one of the issues that we um, discuss in the sense that there are uh, some of the platform cooperatives that have been doing an empirical study uh, of, which are almost entirely comprising women. And in, a, in the interviews that I've been doing, uh, that has definitely been raised as an issue in terms of the type of issues that they um, are concerned about uh, in the sense, and as well as uh, when I say concerned about, I mean, they are concerned in terms of, um, you know, like the demands of governance on their time and then taking it away from other responsibilities that they might have. And that also affects their perceptions of what the advantages of certain digital tools are. So for instance, um, as opposed to a cooperative that would require in-place meetings, the fact that um, a platform cooperative might be using various digital tools to encourage um, meetings asynchronously or um, al al allow meetings to happen um, simultaneously in many different places is something that uh, um, at least some of my interviews found to be useful because it allowed them to balance their commitments at home um, our commitments elsewhere with our work commitments. So it is definitely something um, we are looking at in terms of uh, our, you know, the, the interviews and we're sensitive to this. Um, I, I, I don't know if I would say that it is the, um, well, I guess our focus is, is, is on, is on mo more than just this issue as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I, I see two other hands. I don't know whether I should let them first before I continue asking. Well, if it's only two other hands for now, I think you can briefly ask the second question as well, and then we'll hand over. So the other question is, you, you actually uh, spoke about how uh, there is a drive for scale in platform co-ops, which is a, a common drive in, in a lot of uh, digital kind of businesses and but and you mentioned or you that it's largely has a negative effect and I wonder negative effect in in what sense so uh, here again you know when we're saying about the negative effects or the mixed effects I was always referring to the effect on participation because um, you know in my presentation I was talking about participation for for uh, quite a bit of time we were curious in seeing how these different distinguishing features end up uh, shaping how members participate. And one of the issues we found with scale is that as it started, not only in scale in terms of size of members, uh, but also geographic scale, uh, mm -hmm. it made it harder for members to actively participate. Um, this is, again, like a, ge a generalized finding based on of like 22 platform cooperatives we looked at out of which we used 21 for the paper. Um, and so there are many different types of even platform labor cooperatives, there are different reasons. And in our paper, we go into the nuances of a bit of why there could be these differences, um, you know, while preserving the anonymity of uh, the, our respondents. But um, there are of course dynamics uh, such as some trying to operate globally and having members all over the world while others um, having a very local focus and then the, their idea of scale is very different. Mm. I see that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Isabel is next on the list. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Well, thank you. So, can you hear me fine? Yes. Um, okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sonia. Uh, thank you for your uh, presentations, Roto and Morshed. Thank you so much. Uh, that was uh, really uh, fascinating talks. Um, I wanted to hear more from you now um, about what you think what you think are key takeaways from your own knowledge about the cooperative movement uh, for uh, firms which are not cooperative um, 
democratization. So what can what what if you are talking to people who are not so much into you know the the study of cooperatives, but if you are talking to people uh, who are studying capitalist firms and wondering uh, how to transform capitalist firms so that they could look more like cooperative firms, uh, what? are your current thoughts about the key takeaways from your own research uh, that could help uh, these type of scholars, these type of actors to think about the stakes within capitalist firms? I know this is a huge question, but I would love to hear maybe one or two key takeaways. Where, where do you think we should put our eyes now? Um, what are the key um, the key challenges uh, today. Who wants to start? A big question indeed. Sonia, maybe you want to go first? Well, big question. <laughs> I don't know, maybe uh, for me, one, um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm working with a sector um, which has its own specificities, uh, way speakers. Um, you know, the majority of way speakers are actually not organized into cooperatives. They are on account members, most of them. And for me, uh, from the work that I follow since the beginning of the cooperative movement here in Brazil, one thing that it has always been difficult for the cooperative movement is how to balance the solidarity logic and democratic principles that are, should be our foundation or should be foundational in the cooperative movement with the market logic. Uh, because most of the cooperatives, you know, they are, they are, they, they, yeah, they are working as, a, as a, you know, um, providing services uh, to the market. And this has brought about a lot of uh, challenges, challenges that, you know, when I was hearing, uh, sorry if I get your nom name wrong the third uh, Ma Maresh uh, Morshed Morshed sorry about that <laughs> Morshed when I was listening to your talk and uh, you were talking about uh, participation you know some of the challenges how to keep participation uh, uh, maintaining member participation it is key right and, uh, and it's also key in terms of how members understand themselves within the, the, the cooperative uh, 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 because what we find here is that at least in the sector uh, that I work with, uh, the members, not only we have the difficulty of maintaining their participation uh, high in terms of all the democratic processes, but it's how to really get them to understand that they are their own bosses. <laughs> we are having a lot of problems of cooperatives here in which way speakers leave the cooperative and are taking the cooperative to court because uh, you know, of many uh, claims regarding uh, social protection, you know, like uh, uh, paying what we call the, our um, a security system here. And so, I, I think it's, yeah, for me, it's, this is something that it's really a big challenge. And if we are to take an enterprise, which is so, or it's driven by the market logic, uh, it's going to have more or less the same kind of challenges that the cooperatives have. Uh, how to find a balance between the solidarity logic and the market logic and how to uh, really uh, build the capacity of members to really uh, be able to keep the business running as well as keeping the social solidarity logic. I don't know if it was clear, but anyways, my first thoughts. 
So Lotte or Marcid, would you want to add something from your perspective? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I think that, you know, this work that I mentioned by Bernstein in particular is quite interesting in this respect because his book um, that I refer to, or Workplace Democratization, Its Internal Dynamics, has a very um, interesting section which compares everything from a worker cooperative to state-owned enterprises to the Berlin Means Corporation. And it talks about um, the issue of participation in terms of degrees of control, issues um, that are given um, for workers to participate in, and the level of our organization in which participation occurs. And of course, you know, in even a traditional Berlin means type of corporation where there is no worker participation in terms of trade unions, works councils, or board level employee representation, you can still have, uh, you know, like a suggestions box. And you can sort of have that as the lowest level of participation up till, you know, um, a workers council being the sort of primary authority. Um, so I think that is still really valuable in terms of looking at this whole earlier research uh, by him, by Christopher Mackin, um, uh, David Ellerman, and of course, you know, uh, as Isabel's uh, own work as well about bicameral systems so, at the board. So I think that's, um, I think, a really important democratic aspect. If I say something that's non-democratic and a bit beyond the participation issue I raised, I'd say there is a lot to learn from cooperatives in terms of some of the last principles that we see in the, you know, the cooperative principles. That is uh, cooperation among cooperatives and education and training. And I think uh, there's a lot that corporations could be doing in this respect that they, are, that they don't do, partly because they don't see it as being valuable and partly for, you know, the, let's say competition law uh, inhibiting certain types of behavior. And I think um, one example of this can be, for instance, the creation of reserve funds. Those reserve funds can be allocated to training workers, but those reserve funds can also be used more creatively, uh, where if they're indivisible, um, they might be allocated for different purposes uh, than, um, you know, what a normal um, company would be doing, where they would distribute their profits to uh, their shareholders. Um, by declaring a dividend. Here, we can imagine education and training. We can imagine even supporting the creation of new worker-owned enterprises. Yeah. You want oh, to ask me? Him? Yeah, if you like. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, uh, I think that the most basic problem in the capitalist system, in my opinion, is about social relations where people are placed lower than the power of capital. Cooperatives are the most likely way to value people more than capital, where humans are also recognized for equality in the making decision about the everyday life. Cooperatives are a fundamental rival of capitalism because humans are more important than capital. I think cooperatives, the most likely way to create equitability equitable economic relation in the micro level uh, uh, to macro economic level. This is like a brick to brick systems. Thank you. Thank you. Now I see three hands and we're already getting towards the end of the session if we take a lot of long answers. So I would ask everyone to be brief, but maybe we can take them all one after the other. So I hand over the word to Daniela Bigi. Ooh, is he still here? Yes. Hi, everybody. Oh, Thanks yeah. uh, to the speakers for the presentation. <clears throat> Mine wanted to be a contribution. Um, I'm studying uh, worker cooperatives and recovered enterprises in Italy. I, I'm a PhD in economics. I'm doing that anyway. And um, I can write something more in the chat, but uh, for Italy, we have both an important uh, cooperative tradition which has translated into laws protecting uh, cooperatives into specific sectors, and another law which is on the positive side, the Marcora law, which allows for uh, workers buyout to be financed by the state. Um, actually, the two things are in uh, contradiction, a contradiction that has been uh, highlighted in the fact that if the state tries to develop and to empower cooperatives, it leads them actually to their de degeneration because it leads them to uh, price competition. Uh, whereas on the other hand, um, 
any act of the state that enables workers to take voice and power uh, that usually has very good and uh, multidimensional positive consequences. So I wanted to make you, I mean, to make you aware if you aren't already about this marker law and also about the formula for the democratizing work movement, if I, if I may, that is conflictual or antagonistic mutualism. So make it so that um, the, the workers' struggles in general are supported as ideally and concretely as possible in any given situation, while at the same time developing political and conflictual awareness, since we do have enemies like the employers, but sometimes also the state. Uh, that's it, but I can uh, develop more in the chat. Thank you. I'm sorry for taking your time. Thank you, Daniela. Does any of the three speakers want to quickly react or should we just move to the next question? Then we do that, then Flavia has a question. But you're still muted, yeah. No, yeah. Uh, no I think uh, we should uh, maybe Herman do first because... Yes, we can also have Herman first. Herman, we don't see you, but let's see what I can hear. Okay, um, so can everyone hear me? I'm yes. speaking. Okay, great. So um, again, thank you for everyone's input in this meeting. Um, so I think today's theme is mostly about the uh, operative moments and large shows with specific so I think I'm going to throw a more general question about the relationship between um, cooperative movements and the labor movement at large. So I'm kind of wondering how at the present time should the cooperative movements, the actors engaging in these movements, making their efforts through the movement, um, deal with the labor movement at large. Say how should the so activists in this cooperative movement deal with other labor activists like union leaders like they like labor unions mostly deal with the private employers the private managers and they surely have more experience of dealing with the um the the, the very essence of capitalist activities every day but i've learned that in many countries in many places the union movement is not very um, empathetic with cooperatives, not very empathetic with this workers' self management kind of project. So I don't know if um, can at the end today build a sort of um, more solid, solidaristic um, link between cooperative cooperative movement and labor movement and other 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 factions other branches like and i think most importantly maybe labor union movement now the audio was a little bit bad but i think the the gist of the question was the relation between cooperatives and the labor movement in general right so i'm looking at our three speakers who wants to yes. pick this up oh. Yeah, maybe I can just quickly uh, mention, uh, you know, at, at least here, you know, the labor movement, at least here in Brazil, had largely ignored the informal economy movements in the past. Uh, but in the last decades, there has been more uh, cooperation between uh, the more traditional uh, union movements and one experience that it's interesting to note is the uh, sorry, I I had been muted. Can, did now you... we can. There was a little clip, but now we can hear you again. Yeah. Okay. I I was just saying that uh, you know traditionally the labor movement did ignored the informal economy uh, uh, movement in the past, here at least in my geography. 
But in the last uh, decade or so, there has been closer cooperation. And one such example is the, uh, is the cooperation between the Workers' uh, Federation, Kuch, uh, and with the Way Speakers Movement in the creation of a union of um, called Unisol, which gathers um, like a solidarity economy uh, kind of uh, uh, organizations, cooperatives, associations uh, into a, a, a particular organization, which has been uh, cooperating very closely with the unions in terms of building capacity of workers and developing projects. All of that is documented in a study, which my memory fails me, but I can you know, search and pop the uh, name of the study here, which is a study uh, com uh, commissioned by the ILO and the Open Society Foundation, which maps out four different uh, uh, experiences of cooperation between unions and cooperative movements from different countries. One of them is my country uh, with this case that I just briefly uh, spoke about. I'll look at the title and I'll pop here. Thank you. Yes, thank you for your answer. Do you yeah, to go ahead. Is that something you also want to react to, Moshe? Yeah, or um, Sorot, are you going to? Um, Moshe, please. <laughs> yeah, so I was just going to add that um, I think there is this interest by at least uh, some in the platform cooperativism space in aligning uh, themselves, not just with traditional cooperative movements, but looking beyond the cooperative movement to social and solidarity movements. And this is, uh, I think, a really important, um, you know, driving force for the creation of new platform cooperatives. So I think um, being able to successfully do this will be really important, even if unfortunately, um, it has sometimes been the case that the organized labor movement has been at odds with cooperatives uh, in the past. Thank you. So, Dr. do you also want to yeah. come comment? Yeah, um, Herman, um, I see that the cooperatives are not widely uh, used by labor movement in Indonesia because, as I said in my presentation, the problem with the paradigm, uh, cooperatives are considered only as a way to improve the welfare of the members, but they are worried about the cooperative because the cooperative will actually function to reduce their struggle because they will become accomplice of the corporate management where they work. That is a big problem in this uh, uh, movement here in Indonesia. But uh, when I exercise with, uh, um, with my pilot project, uh, when I go to the ground and uh, I meet a discussion with them and develop the small group of the cooperative with the values of the cooperative uh, and uh, and also uh, uh, their principle, and also we we, we talk about uh, the the importance of the cooperative uh, uh, organization for labor, and uh, we explain about uh, um, uh, the advantage of the cooperative for the labor, and then they understand then, and then they they start with small uh, cooperative, and now it's growing so fast, and uh, the leader now. Uh, become the um, cooperative department. Uh, he, he is, is just a uh, 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 common labor, but he, he became uh, a leader of the, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, he, he led the department of the uh, cooperative in the labor party now. It's so very interesting. <laughs> and I'm proud to him. Thank you for that concrete example also. So before we will end at half past, we want to briefly give the floor to Isabel to announce the next events, but that's a leave some 
time for a last question by Flavia, which then maybe can be answered just by one person. Flavia, over to you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for these amazing presentations. Um, my question is regarding legal framework, because we know that cooperatives are not uh, new legal institutes. Uh, now they're gaining more, I think, centrality because of platform cooperatives. They are reaching the global north, but in the global south, they were, they were always there with the old informality and precarious work. Uh, I, I, I am really intrigued about the cooperativist paradoxes because uh, in the global south for a long time, they, they used to be uh, instruments for label frauds regarding outsourcing. And also, there are very uh, potential in the, in the cooperatives. For example, in Brazil, Sonia uh, probably already know, but in Ceará, uh, there is a new environmental law for waste pickers that it gives uh, income, tr income transfer for these waste pickers uh, to go uh, to organize in cooperatives. Uh, and this uh, environmental law recognize that waste pickers organized in cooperatives, they are produce environmental value. So it's also very revolutionary if you think they are questioning the very legal concept of value. So my question is, how law can avoid uh, this legal fraud to, uh, in, to give an impulse to this revolutionary role of cooperatives. Is this for Sonia directly or? No, for everyone. Any, any of, of course, also a big question and we have little time left. Maybe a brief reaction from one of the speakers who wants to take this. Um. Maybe if you like in, in a couple of seconds, maybe we have more than one. I think one uh, really important role is by looking at um, how the law can create mechanisms for financing uh, these cooperatives. And, it, you know, there's a whole role about finding appropriate forms of financing for create like a, making the cooperative form accommodate, um, let's say, new types of financial instruments without uh, threatening the core, you know, cooperative principles. But I would love to talk about this by email more. Yes, and very briefly, I think at least from our context in Brazil, we have a huge problem in terms of the legal framework for cooperatives because our cooperative law benefits the bigger cooperatives. It's not a popular economy kind of cooperative law. And this has been one of the key demands from the cooperative movement here to have a reform in the law that can really accommodate this kind of solidarity economy cooperatives that we are at least, you know, from uh, coming from the informal economy. Yeah, just very, very. Thank you so much. I feel terrible about having to cut off this discussion just when it gets more and more interesting. Also, of course, more and more questions coming up, but that's um, the nature of these kinds of discussions. And I hope that you could all take away as many impulses as I could. And now for the last minute, I hand over to Isabel to briefly say something about the next events. Here. I, I think Suroto wants to say something. Lisa. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, um, Flavia, um, uh, this is a very interesting talking about the regulation and uh, legal framework. And I have uh, wrote, uh, um, uh, I have wrote uh, for ICA, uh, Asia and Pacific for uh, the big problem, uh, the cooperative law in Indonesia. And then uh, <clears throat> I can send to you and uh, um, many, many, uh, yeah, many trouble with the legal. Uh, as I, I said in my presentation that, that that cooperative uh, avoid the uh, many many uh, law in the community law or economic law, and uh, uh, in my experience, I also has uh, um, yeah tested the uh, cooperative law in front of the constitutional court, and 
in 2000 and 2014 and they have cancelled the the law and until today uh, we just have a very bad law and uh, I, that I, uh, I have I have wrote uh, about the cooperative law and the environment in the regulation in uh, this country and if you if, if you want it, I can uh, send to you the study uh, yeah you know yeah that I have also sent to Great, thank you so much, Isabel. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you, Lisa, for uh, trying to get us uh, on time. So, um, well, first, I wanted to thank Lisa and Flavia who have started this uh, fantastic series. Uh, it's been a wonderful event today. So thank you for our three panelists. It was so uh, thoughtful. Um, and I, I think we all uh, uh, probably agree that we need more conversation, we, we need more time. And this is, this is exactly the vision that we have behind this uh, workshop series. It's the idea that we will meet on a regular basis uh, uh, as, a, as a global you know, network to continue uh, to deepen this conversation, not only with uh, scholars who study these uh, um, um, real experiments, but also with the actors who are uh, uh, leading on the three principles that the Democratizing Work Manifesto is built around democratizing work, decommodifying labor, and decarbonizing the planet. So I posted the, the link again in the chat please uh, go uh, to that page so you will see the next three meetings that we have already scheduled. But what's very important to say is that we envision this as a place where you, as a member of the network or as a coordinator or member of a national chapter of democratizing work, could suggest uh, one such workshop. So please be in touch. We really want to be uh, a, a, a decentralized and coordinated movement from, from the beginning. And so this is a space that you can envision uh, occupy with a topic that is connected to our three principles and that you want the whole network to start think about. So uh, we hope uh, we will meet again in this context. We, we, we really uh, have lots of work to do together, but we think that as we look at what's happening really in the world, we really are uh, making a difference as a network to learn more from it and to, uh, um, to, to learn from each other. So thank you so much. I wanted to um, uh, especially also uh, um, thank the Italian national chapter because over the last weekend, they had a fantastic event in Bologna uh, uh, and they really uh, gathered as a national chapter. And this is also something that we, we feel are so important. These conversations can be global, they, but they should also be grounded in the national context, in the actual context where action is taking place. And Flavia uh, flew from Brazil to be able to spend the whole weekend with uh, the, the Italian national chapter and is now uh, doing a real tour in France and in Italy around our book translated into uh, Italian. So there are lots of lots of events going on around uh, democratizing work. Uh, be in touch, uh, check the website and thank you everyone uh, for all that you're doing. See you soon at the latest. Our next date is thus December the 14th, December the 14th here online. So we'll know about what's going on in Spain, where there are major developments about democratizing the corporate firm. Very exciting. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.